Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Vogt, Derek Young here with you from K-State Online. You're on three home for all the info on the cats that you need. And, and there's a lot of good things going on right now. That's that's always a, a fun time uh, when there's winning going on. Moods are in better spots for a lot of people, mine included. I've always yeah, said it's much more fun <laughs> to, uh, to, to cover a team that's winning because, yeah, like watching a team win games is more fun. Uh, the team is more fun to cover when they're winning. And certainly, uh, since I entered the team site space a year ago, it's a whole lot more fun to deal with all of you guys when they're winning as opposed to losing or not playing well in wins. Uh, and I certainly know that I contribute to that feeling of not greatness when they uh, they don't play well in wins. But K-State, 2-0 to start Big 12 play. Yes, we are well aware that the two teams that they beat could very likely finish at the bottom of the Big 12 when all is said and done. DY's thinking about it. You, you got a, a different contender? Yeah, Oklahoma State. But, hey, even Oklahoma State has battled with Baylor at home. They took them to overtime. Um, but, and but, UCF yeah. beat KU, so. Yeah, it's true. Anything can happen. Really, West Virginia is the only one that hasn't put up a fight in a game yet this year uh, of, the, of the Big 12 schools that are out there. And if you look at the Big 12 standings, you might laugh at it right now. But, hey, the games that have been played tell you that Baylor – Texas Tech and K-State are the only ones that have made it through two Big 12 games unbeaten so far this year, which seems wild. And we know that by the weekend, at least one more will have a loss because K-State and Texas Tech play each other uh, because the major upset probably of conference play this year happened last night. KU going on the road. They were up 16 with like four minutes left in the, in the first half, and they end up losing at UCF, a team that I think we both said going into the K-State-UCF game, UCF, yeah, we know they're not good. They're not as bad as as maybe some would think. And then K-State just dog-walked them in Manhattan. It was not close at any point in that game. Uh, we talked about it afterwards. I think it was, it was either on the Sunday show or something. I said, hey, like uh, it's tough because K-State gets such a big lead and it shrinks to like 20 and you're starting to want to nitpick and get angry about things. It's like, they're up 20 points right now. That game was never close. Yeah, I was going to say, that that game was not even as close as the score indicated. I mean, Kansas State was yeah. winning at one point 60 to 25. <laughs> um, and you never see that in Big 12 play. And then a couple of days later, that team beats yeah. KU. So it's pretty bizarre. Like you said, West Virginia, the only team that hasn't really been competitive yet. That's probably going to change soon once they get Jesse Edwards back. Mm -hmm. um, because right now they're just getting dominated in the interior by just about anyone. Uh, <laughs> and Kansas State obviously is taking steps forward in that area because David Gasson's playing the best basketball of his career. And Will McNair had a had a big game as well. So uh, And then Jarrell Colbert came in with, I think, two blocks and four rebounds. So I don't want to take anything away from what he did either. The biggest winner so far through the first week of the Big 12 slate might be Scott Drew. Because not only are the Bears 2-0, the other teams that are 2-0 are from his coaching tree. Yeah, very true. It's a great point. Yeah. The Scott, Scott Drew's Drew connection. It's a Scott Drew's league, and everybody else is just living in it. Uh, one of the other things that's you know kind of fascinating, too, when you look at what's going on now, the Big 12 has three top 10 teams as it currently stands. They all lost road games in the midweek. KU goes on the road to UCF. OU goes on the road to TCU. And then Houston went on the road and lost to Iowa State. The Iowa State loss is probably the most palatable of all of those just because we know that Hilton Coliseum is probably top three toughest places to play in the Big 12 right now. I, I don't know what your top three would be, but obviously Allen is number one, as TCU found out over the weekend. Yeah. And I, then I think you can make the case that Hilton and Bramlage are in the running for two and three behind Allen. I, I have a hard time making a top three because there is just so many good ones. And Coach yeah. Dane got into that during his Thursday press conference because obviously they have to be good for this place to be on fire. But that's kind of the case with all these, with the yeah. exception of Kansas, but they're always good. Yeah, yeah. They've um, never had to figure out what it's like to draw a crowd when they're bad. So that's, yeah. yeah. But like when Texas Tech is good, United Supermarkets yep. Arena is absolutely on fire. The only ones that are, and now I, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve judgment on the four new schools until we get more of a sample size, I think. But the only 
there's three that I think, especially since one's getting rectified right now, there's only three places that I think are deader than dead, even when they're pretty competent. And two of those are the Oklahoma schools. Yeah. Because they lack an environment for whatever reason. And the other one being TCU, just because they have a tough draw too. Mm-hmm. At one point, that was Baylor. I think their new arena might have fixed that. Yeah, going small uh, it probably definitely helps their situation there because it's looked full and, and probably pretty rowdy. So that that's a smart move by them. Uh, look, and, when it, going to uh, just to stick on that because we probably need to hammer this point home. The fact that there is so many good environments and we know BYU's probably right there. Mm-hmm. They're going to fit in pretty well when it comes to an environment. Um, I'm not sure about Houston, but they're good, so it really doesn't matter. It's <laughs> small. No, I mean, normally during the American stuff, they didn't draw a great crowd. I, maybe because they're in the, the Big 12, games, it might. elevates yeah. and looks a little bit better. And they, But, yeah, I, 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 and I've, UCF, I've not heard good things about the Fertitta Center. They've, they've redone it and remodeled it, so I think it's nice. But crowd-wise, I've never heard that it's anything special. And I think Cincinnati UCF, it might just be dictated by the opponent, I would yeah. guess, but I'm not certain on that Cincinnati either. I would imagine that probably has like they have a good, they're good that they'll draw but what's it going to be I do think this team this year like Wes Miller has them energized and that's the other thing to, to bring up real quick about road games this week I mean Texas is a, a lucky bounce away from Max Aismas' shot from also losing on the road at Cincinnati this week um that I mean that that's a big deal like road teams they, they struggle in this league regardless of who they're playing. And if you go and look at what happened in the Big 12 this week and how it played out, the only team that went on the road in the Big 12 this week and won was K-State and Texas. And as I mentioned, Texas, it took them a last-second shot. So K-State went on the road and did it by yeah. double digits, which is significant. Yeah, yeah. so the two points to hammer home, one, you don't doesn't matter how much – well, three points. One, it doesn't matter how it happens. Te- Texas just won in the Big 12 – And that's a big deal. Two, doesn't matter how bad or good the team is or what they are playing, winning on the road in the Big 12 is tough. Kansas State deserves a lot of credit, too. And three, they're going to still be good, and I would still consider them a Final Four threat. But what Houston is going to run into now, as a even as a top five team in the Big 12, and Kansas will probably like let them could let them know this. It doesn't matter if you're Houston or Kansas. You are vulnerable on the road every night in the Big 12 because you can't – like Houston's not going to get to go to Navy, right? Yeah. Or, or you know, there are no – they had gimmies on the schedule last year. They could take mm-hmm. nights off and even went on the road. Um, you can't take a night off on the road in the Big 12. You can barely take a night off at home. Yeah. So – Houston's good team. They're a great team. They're still a Final Four contender. But the body of work that it takes, like they're not going 30 and two. Like yeah. that's just not going to happen. Uh last season, Houston only lost one road game in conference play. Or actually, excuse me, they did not lose a single road game in conference play. Their only conference loss was at home to Temple of all teams. But you're right. Like l- last year, their road trips were Tulsa, Cincinnati. Tulane, UCF, Wichita State, Temple, SMU, East Carolina, and then Memphis. Memphis was probably the most comparable crowd because I I remember that from when we were down there for the Liberty Bowl. Memphis draws a really good crowd there for being in a metropolitan city and everything. Um, But like you're not facing that kind of stuff day in, day out. And that was my point with Houston is while the talent is there, it's going to take them time to adjust to playing this type of schedule. Yeah. It's going to wear them out. They're not used to it, and that's the thing where like them getting got in Ames is not the most surprising thing to me. No, it's and it's and and I want to point this out. It's also not an indictment on them. It's yes. just that tough. And the, what they're going to find out is they're probably got their eyes opened at Hilton Coliseum. There's about seven or eight other road games they got coming up. They're going to look a lot like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and one other credit to K-State in their win over West Virginia. Because, again, people are going to say, yeah, you're 2-0 in league play, but it's UCF, whatever. Well, now we know that UCF, they have the juice to beat anybody in this league, which I did not think they had until last night. They proved me wrong. And then 
yeah, it's West Virginia, but you did it on the road. You did it in a convincing way. And that was even with like overcoming some adversity in the first yeah. half where we talked about like K-State couldn't play their defense the way they wanted because of the way the game was officiated in that first half. But they overcame it and played a phenomenal second half, adjusted, and they ended up outscoring West Virginia by 16 in the second half. Yeah, and judge West Virginia all they want. They are not a good team. And yeah. they're still figuring out how to make all the pieces fit And because they have had the best, the, the bad luck and the misfortune to basically not knowing who's going to be available on any given night because of the transfer portal legislation, the suspensions, the injuries. Like, they get bad pill after bad pill. I feel bad for Josh Eiler. But at the same time, like, that's not a reason to diminish what K-State did in Morgantown because less than two weeks before that, West Virginia took Ohio State into overtime on a neutral floor. Yeah. And and this is the highlight, what is significant about winning on the road here. So this was a, a tweet I saw this afternoon, and it just kind of showed where the teams inside of Ken Palm rank in terms of winning on the road. So these are just in, in road games against top 100 Ken Palm opponents this year. Ken Palm teams 1 through 10, they're 12 and 12 on, on the road, true road games. So they're 500. Everybody else, 11 through 20, 6 and 13, 21 through 35 and 11, 31 through 49 and 14, 41 through 56 and 16. So even the, the best of the best teams, when they go on the road against a top 100 opponent, if you're not in that top 10, you're basically coming out and winning only about a third of those games. Like that, that to me is significant and shows the power of a road trip. I mean, I, I think if you go and look at what's taking place, like, the ACC might be a good example right now. If you look at what, what's gone on with Clemson, I know that their fans are uh, freaking out and everything because they, they've they lost a couple games now. They're one and three to start conference oh, I play. Thought, I, thought, I thought you were going to say they were freaking out because they might lose Dabo to Bama. I was like, I, uh, I, I think, think they, they might I, celebrate that. Yeah, I was like, I think they might pay Alabama to take yeah. Dabo. But th the point of this is two of those three losses – it's at Miami, it's at Virginia Tech, and so road games. And then North Carolina, you lost at home, but like North Carolina's playing like one of the best teams in the country. And Carolina, I mean, I don't know exactly where they're at at Kimpon, but they're probably, yeah, they're number 10. So they got a road win last night at NC State, and that's significant because that's where those top 10 Kimpon teams, they fare better, just barely. They're still just 500 in road games against top 100 teams. So that road win is significant, no matter how you want to diminish the opponent. And this week in the Big 12 just kind of solidified that even more. So outside of winning on the road at West Virginia, what else stood out to you from the way K-State played and were able to get the job done out in Morgantown? Yeah, I mean, it's it's still defense. This team's defense is elite, so that stands out. Um you said besides getting the road win, but I mean, that is substantial. And I know we've kind of belabored the point, but you know, or another reason why it's substantial is we kind of alluded to it. Like Kansas State, they are, what do you think? They'll lose two games at most in league play at home. That would be the hope. The way they're playing right now, I would say that that's probably just, something that you can I, bank I, on. Yeah, and I and it wouldn't surprise me if they only lost one and went on, or yeah. went undefeated in Bramblage. I think Kansas State has that much of a home court advantage because, and I anticipate, I mean, I mean Bramblage Coliseum. Now, the weather might play a little bit of a factor because I think it's going to be freezing but cold, and yeah, we're going to have by by the time it gets here over the last week and a half, we're going to have 15 inches of snow probably between the two storms because I think there's a a little bit of a storm, more snow coming in, but. What Baylor's Monday night, I want to say, or is that Tuesday night? Uh, Baylor's Tuesday night and then Oklahoma State on Saturday. Well, I know it's going to be really, really cold. The roads will be fine, but there'll be a lot of snow on the ground still, I think. Mm -hmm. But if those two things don't play a factor, I thought they have much of a factor at that point. I mean, that crowd for Baylor, especially if Kansas State could pull something yeah. out of their hat in Lubbock, that crowd for Baylor might be phenomenal. I will say this. You look at the home schedule for K-State, I I think if you're planning on being an NCAA tournament team, uh, you should you should just say you, at most you lose one game at home uh, because the road the home schedule isn't as challenging as it could be just because you don't see Houston or Texas at home this year. Yeah, but KU and Baylor. Yeah, so that's, that's true. Why. KU and Baylor, I guess. But um, I I think you 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 would expect that you can get one of those because of how you play 
and and where this thing is trending and how much you would hype up the home crowd and what they could do for you. I think that that would Maybe, be something that's there. Yeah, I agree because I started to think that, but I also kind of viewed it as this just get one of the Texas Tech or Baylor games. So I don't know. It's Yeah, I will also I will also admit that I still don't respect BYU and Oklahoma. I'm a little closer to respecting BYU uh after they, you know, they went on the road and challenged Baylor, but I You just I'm, like I'm, Mark Pope. You just like Mark Pope going off on the refs. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe that's a man after my heart right there. I don't know. I I I should give him some credit, but also they lost at home to Cincinnati, so that's weird. Um I I really don't know what to make of the Big 12 because it's been a it's been a weird start to the week. This is truly a year where I mean 14 teams, so more teams than we've ever had in it, and it's gonna we're not gonna know what to make of it until we get to the end and the full season is played out and we have a full sample size to tell us how every, how everything looks. But I know, yeah. I know they lost last night, but I, I I'm starting to become a little bit of a believer in Oklahoma because I. Now they they have to make sure that all the pieces are still fitting together, but there's some individual pieces for them that I really like, and Uzan is one of them. That guy is good. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll talk a little more about the Big Twelve this weekend coming up uh, when we look at the Big Twelve scoreboard. Well, I mean, look that the the West Virginia thing. I think the most significant thing is you got the road win. You did it in convincing fashion in the second half. You battled through some minor adversity. And you got you got performances that are starting to su- suggest that there is some consistency there. Look, like David Gasson, you're not always going to get 17 points from him, no. but if you get that type of game where he's cleaning up the glass still, he's got 21 rebounds through the first two games of Big 12 play. He's been consistent on the boards. I think I saw is he third in the Big 12 currently in rebounding. Should, and, and at this point, like he should be a lock for first team All Big 12 defense. Yeah, I mean he's he's playing good inside. We know Cam Carter, he had the cumulative scoring there. He was good at the free throw line, which was big, and really the team in general Two had made players. good marks there. So yep. and I, you know, Cam Carter, I think the, the most impressive thing, and I should give him credit for this for how he played against West Virginia, because this was the first thing that stood out to me about Keontae Johnson last year. It was the Nebraska game in Kansas City, where obviously we had seen flashes from Keontae throughout the start, and it's like, man, this guy the, this is a steal K-State got, but he struggled in the first half of that game against Nebraska and came out in the second half and totally flipped things around and got it going. Cam Carter had a really bad first half. Like he was playing not good basketball. He was probably hurting K-State in some ways, at least on the offensive end. And in the second half, he was a totally different dude where he was playing smart. He was making plays for him. And that's the kind of thing there that, kind of signals to me that things are turning around for this team where when things aren't going well a switch can be flipped and now you have individual guys that can elevate their play within a game and you need that to be able to win in the big 12 and eventually in the ncaa tournament if if you get there because things aren't always going to be easy when you're facing teams as good as you get in the big 12 and then who you will face in march so that was a significant step not just for K-State as a team, but to me for Cam Carter as an individual player where I know statistically the numbers have been there to for him to be respected as a really, really good player this year. But I think we're actually seeing some more steps being taken to that actually being true and it not just being numbers that tell us this, but also the intangible stuff that goes with being a good basketball player. I would agree. I mean, he's he's probably one of the better two-way players in the league in terms of his offensive ability and production, and you could pair that with being one of the best perimeter defenders in the Big 12. So um, one of the better two-way players, David Gasson, I think is all Big 12 first-team defense if it ended today, or at least he should be. Tyler Perry still needs to take the open look when it's there. Oh, he's playing good. Like yeah. we're probably harping and criticizing Tyler Perry too much just because we know he can be a guy that can make four or five threes per game. Like literally, and that's what we want because that's very aesthetically pleasing to our eyes as well. And it's fun to cover and it's fun to watch. Like we want what happened against UCF to be now that was a little bit more right. Especially since you felt like you made all of them in in like a two minute period, but close to that or a semblance of that is what we want the expectation to be. I don't think that's unrealistic. I, I think that is more than realistic. 
but he just has to take the shots. I Because I do think he gets into his own head a little bit. But yeah. aside from that, he's still playing well. He's actually doing the other stuff better than we thought he would do, to be quite yeah, honest. So, true. And he's not as much of a defensive liability. Probably still is because of his limitations, but not as much as what we were expecting. Arthur Kaluma is another guy. Now, he did it right, I felt like, in the last game against West Virginia. But that dude's shooting almost 40% from three at this point. Yeah. Like, stop. We don't need to do the the pump fake Euro step, dribble into traffic, take a tough, tough two. We don't need to do that. Like, you're shooting lights out from three. Just be a ringer from three. For, for, for points of the season last year, because teams had to honor his drive and his physicality, but – like Keontae Johnson just had to be a sharp shooting three point shooter, and he was. And I think that's what Arthur Kaluma needs to be at this point. Or you know, take what the defense gives him at least, and they're giving him that. And he's, I think he needs to believe that he's a better three point, sh- like an elite three point shooter. Yeah. Um, last takeaway from West Virginia, I wrote about it in the instant takeaways, but I thought. You know, Jerome Tank's been talking about what Dorian Finister provides this team and why he is getting minutes, and he belabors that point. And he also is very transparent sometimes in press conferences about why the bench is short on a certain night if it's only six or seven guys. Well, it was 11 guys against West Virginia, Mm -hmm. I think, 10 or 11. And I thought that some of those other players finally heeded that message because Jarrell Colbert came in with his hair on fire a rim yeah. protector, blocking shots, rebounding the ball, a different intensity and energy level about him than the last time that we had seen him. You could tell that he wanted to go out there and prove a point to his head coach or at least to eat his message and deliver what Coach Tang was asking of him. R.J. Jones was making mistake after mistake even when he did get in. But what I liked is it was because he was trying so hard to play hard, right? Like there was one time the ball was just on the floor. Yeah, All he has to do is pick it up throw it, probably easy, fast break bucket. He dove on the floor, didn't need to. He's trying to prove a point to his coaches that he wants this bad. So I thought those messages that those players were sending were at least good signs, especially from a bench standpoint. Yeah, no, that that is a good thing. Also, real quick, one thing that just randomly I I looked up today because I got to thinking about it. Um, And, you know, it's helpful because he had a good game against West Virginia and he's given K-State – Uh, some good performances this year that I didn't expect to this extent. Uh, Will McNair, think about how this worked out for K-State. And they were trying very hard and almost seemed like they had Mo Wag from West Virginia locked up and locked in. If you get him, you probably don't get Will McNair. Will McNair is doing more for K-State this year than what Wag is doing at Alabama. And I I think – that's one of those, in, in hindsight, K-State lucked out because Will McNair has been a really good player for them this season. And it's bad luck more than anything, but the Quez Glover-Joe Toussaint trade, not as well, because Quez yeah. Glover injured and Joe Toussaint having the season of his career in uh Lover. Yeah. There, there is no – look, I think Joe Toussaint would have been a helpful player, and certainly for what K-State needed, he would have given you experience. He would have helped on the defense. Like, there are things that he would have been able to help you with, what he's doing offensively this season, there was zero indication that that would be a thing for for Joe Toussaint. I mean, he's never averaged more than nine points a game in his career, and now the, the shooting has regressed a little bit. He's shooting now under 33%, which is what he was last year uh, at West Virginia. But he, at one point, it was a little higher than that, and he was having some bust-out games. Like There was no way to know that that's the version of Joe Toussaint you would get uh, but he's been good in Big 12 play for for Texas Tech. He's you know averaging 14 a game in the two Big 12 appearances. So, um, and I would say moving forward, I would expect him to even have probably a little, even more regression. Yeah. So we're probably not feeling the same about this in say a month or two, because I think Texas Tech's going to go away. But you are jealous of his health at least. Yeah, but because I think Texas Tech, you know, and I guess I would say, as long as the legal stuff falls in their favor will probably be more centered on pop Isaacs than Joe Toussaint. Yeah. Uh, that's a good transition. Let's talk about it. K state at Texas tech this weekend, three o'clock tip time ESPN two right now. Ken Palm favors Texas tech 73 to 66. So the red Raiders at home, they have the advantage over K state. 
Uh, this will be the only time that these two teams meet each other this season. So only mm-hmm. one chance at Texas Tech this year for K-State. It will be on the road at United Supermarkets Arena, which, as we talked about earlier, it's not the easiest place to go, especially when Tech is good. They have an engaged fan base right now because the team is 13-2 and and 2-0 and in league play. We just talked a little bit about Joe Toussaint. He's one piece of this machine. The big ticket item, though, is probably Pop Isaacs, who, yes, despite all this stuff going on there, he is still playing. So tip of the hat to Grant McCaslin for wanting to win basketball games and screw being a good person after that. The president and the president, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, wink, wink, and the president. Uh, What do you expect from K-State's trip to Lubbock this weekend, and, and what should they be prepared for? I think it's going to be a nail biter. I really do. I one because you have a guy that's coached with Grant McCaslin, and you have a player that's played for Grant McCaslin. I think these two teams are probably built similarly. I have basically probably, you know, I I would assume the same basketball principles and thoughts for the most part. I'm sure they're, you know, I don't. I guess I haven't dissected it too enough too much, but I assume Texas Tech's also running the same exact defense that Kansas State's running. So I think these teams are so similar. And Grant McCaslin's basically running, you know, the opposite offense that he did in North Texas. And now Jerome Tang acknowledged that in his Thursday press conference too. He said, well, if Grant brought what he was doing in North Texas to Big 12, he'd probably be in trouble because he said the, the defenses in the Big 12 are too good, too athletic, and too suffocating to just take the air out of the ball and hope to grind out a victory every night. He said, that's just not a great winning formula. Now, Bruce Weber would probably disagree, but uh, uh, so that's why great McCaslin's probably changed it. And obviously maybe he's trying to fit, you know, fit what they do to the parts that they do have too. And that's a sign of a good coach. So not look this, if you're going coming into this, assuming that it's going to look like North Texas, it isn't, it's not going to look like North Texas. Yeah. Yeah, North Texas, they they were okay winning a game like 45 to 37. Uh, Texas Tech this year, they've been on a tear scoring the basketball. Um, it has been since November 12th. That would be the last time that uh, Texas Tech failed to score uh, at least 69 points in a game. Uh, and they scored so, 80 a lot. Yeah, they, they've 90 against Oklahoma State, 78 against Texas, and then you can go down the list, 85 against North Alabama, 96 against Sam Houston State, a bunch of 70s and 80s. Uh, and they lost an overtime game to Butler, 103 to 95 this year. Um, they did, if you're trying to play the common opponent game, and you go, man, they beat North Alabama, 85 to 57. They beat Oral Roberts, 82 to 76. They did lose to Villanova, 85 to 69 this season. So, it's tough to play that game. It's a lot easier to do against, you know, high level opponents like Villanova. And now that was a neutral site game for them in at the battle for Atlantis. Speaking of pop Isaacs uh, and K-State obviously got Villanova at home, but the fact that K-State was able to beat Villanova, a team that was capable of winning by 16 over Texas tech, that is significant. And that tells me, there is a chance that K-State can go down and get this win. And the seven po- points that Tech, you know, is, is favored by in Ken Palm and probably close to what the line will end up being, probably either six and a half or seven and a half. I think K-State can keep it closer than that, the way they're playing right now. Everything that you're basing these this stuff off of right now, K-State is playing as a different team and a better team than everything that came before the UCF game outside of a handful of, of games. And I think, you're starting to see K-State get it figured out. And the biggest benefit to the Wildcats right now, and everybody knows I'm not a big defense guy, you know, I take it or leave it. You only win the game if you put the ball in the hole more times than the opponent. But K-State's defense is legit, and we've talked about this a lot. Like, the offense and everything that goes with that is coming along. It's not necessarily NCAA tournament caliber quite yet. The defense is. The defense has K-State as one of, the better teams in the country in that department. I mean, the, the efficiency numbers keep going up. They're inside the top 40 now, and 30. it is the real deal. It's going to give teams problems. So if K-State can just keep giving themselves average at best offensive performances and maybe having a guy and a half go and have a big consistent night for you, that gives you an opportunity in every game. And I think they're at the stage now where 
through through two conference games, we've seen Tyler Perry, Arthur Kaluma, and Cam Carter all have a game where they stepped up. For Perry, it was against UCF, and then we got Kaluma and Carter against West Virginia. I've got faith that at least one of those guys can give you a boost at, at Texas Tech, and I really do think K-State is going to have the opportunity to win this game. I'm not saying they do, but I do think it ends up being closer than those seven points, at least the field of the game. Maybe, you know, fouling and whatever gets it to seven, but this is going to be a good game. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And the two teams know each other too well. The coaches know each other too well for it to not be tight, in my opinion. A couple things in response to what you said. Not just top 40. I think it's now in the defense is now in the top 30 or very close to it. Uh, 34th right now in defensive okay. efficiency. I, uh, some of the things changed there because I think yeah. right after the West Virginia game, I think was the 32. Yeah. So we're, we're they're in the ballpark. And by the way, like a month ago, it was like 121. So mm -hmm. it's been lights out for the last month. And then you talk about the big three stepping up, whether it's Tyler Perry and TCF or Kaluma or Carter against West Virginia. I will say it's got it's got to be two guys. I think at Tech to get the win. Yeah. Yep. No, I would I would agree with that. And you are getting to the stage of conference play where you're going to face more teams where you're going to need more guys on any given night to kind of come through and help you out. I mean, I, I think that is and, something and tech to keep not in deep. mind. One thing to take in mind, take into account, is Tech is not deep. I was looking at some of the stuff that KSU fans sent me for the preview. Mm -hmm. They only have, I'm looking at here, probably similar to K-State, uh, although for K-State it's because they lost Tomlin, Glover's hurt, but Tech only has seven guys averaging 10 minutes or more. Yeah, yeah, that tech tech is fairly similar to K State. They'll they'll shift around their lineup a little bit more, so they're a little more consistent with guys that they will put into the game. But it is probably a team that is they're closer to being eight deep than what K State is. But in reality, Tech is probably a lot closer to being a firm seven, um, and they're going to wear their guards in the ground very similar to what K State is kind of having to do right now with Perry and Carter. So I think it's going to be a fascinating matchup and seeing how, I mean, this is kind of a, a game where you're going to look to Cam Carter again, probably because there are more offensive weapons at the guard spot for Texas Tech. And, you know, I, I'm starting to think Arthur Kaluma probably needs to be the best player for this team in, in an ideal situation. Like if you want, you know, the dreamland. I think Cam Carter would be that guy. I just, I think Arthur Kaluma has the better chance of becoming that, but uh, Cam Carter with his ability and the type of player he is, if you get the best version of him, that that's the guy that I want to step up for you. And I, I think you need to get another good game out of Cam Carter. The one thing that I would beg of him is just make a couple more of those threes, just a couple more of them. Sure. Like he gets some really good looks just bury him, and, and the game goes a lot differently for K-State. I will say that I think the most important player most of these road games will be Tyler Perry because we they say at the NCAA tournament, like the great equalizer, especially for the underdog, is the three-point shot. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Big 12, that's when you go on the road, right, yeah. is the three-point shot. So if Tyler Perry can go out there and make four or five, even six threes again, I mean, that that's probably the most favorable recipe for Kansas State because it's also not asking a lot. That's asking yeah. a guy to do what he can do. Yeah, that's true. And look, I will say, I mean, there is the motivation here for Tyler Perry. Like, no matter how he feels about Grant McCaslin, like, that's his old coach. I would hope that that creates some fire and some energy that we see the more confident second half Tyler from the UCF game that isn't so passive. And when there's a shot, take it, not overthinking things, and you get a really strong performance out of him that can kind of carry you through and be good against Texas Tech. So I this is another opportunity where that UCF, we thought maybe it would be the breakout, kind of regressed against uh, West Virginia, but as you said, like still doing some good things. He's got the motivation here. Big road game against your former coach. Like, go out there and make some plays. Uh, that'll that'll be an exciting thing to see. So, I, I think that's a, a, a benefit to K State this weekend. I, something, you know, we talked about the road stuff a lot already. In and I'm 
we don't really have to, this won't really be a discussion on that, but just an observation. I believe Kansas State's only had two true road games so far, um, if I remember correctly. And they've both been blowout wins, right? LSU yeah. and West Virginia. Yep. So two true road games, two true blowouts. This is a, this is a road team. So maybe maybe yes, they're going to take the cast by like a 1,000 this weekend. Is that what I'm hearing? You're the you're doing the pick and preview because you're the one on the hot streak. So uh, yeah. that onus is on you. So uh, I'm not I'm be, not I'm not so confident in what my pick's going to be this week. I don't know that dessert, I dessert in Lubbock. That's what you just got to call the pick and preview dessert in Lubbock. Mm. Well, I don't know. You know what, I wonder what's a dessert spot in Lubbock. Yeah. They probably got churros of some kind down there. They they served them at the football game, and the Pop Tarts Bowl guy really loved them. So uh, oh, that would I do love a good up. churro. I do love a good churro. I think the first time I ever had it was in Lubbock at Jones AT and T Stadium, so I couldn't really give. Yeah, do it with like out. vanilla sauce too. Oof. Mm, interesting. Well, all right, I'll 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 let you go here. Uh, we typically do this during football, but let's do it here for basketball as well. Uh, if K State is to win, who is your MVP of the game, and then what is your prediction? Tyler Perry. I, I kind of just discussed yeah. it. I think you need the weapon of the three point shot. Two win on the road, that's him because he's the one that can become a firecracker and you know fire off five, six, seven and make five, or make five, six, seven. Heck, what was it? The six against UCF? Didn't it feel like it five in like three minutes? Like, let's yeah, do, yeah, do that, and that, that I feel a lot better about the guys. Look, my prediction, and you know, I'm going to go against the grain here. I think. Beat Texas Tech in Lubbock. One, because this team does appear to have a, a knack for enjoying the road right now. Because mm-hmm. I don't think the LSU-West Virginia thing was necessarily a fluke, and they won decisively. I do think Tech is probably due for a little bit of regression, and you're already seeing that with Joe Toussaint. Like, I think they're a pretty good team. I don't yeah. know if they're this good. And, yeah, and I, and I think Jerome Tang, look – when he plays his former guys, he seems to have their number. Like he, he beat Paul Mills. He, I think he's two and zero against Scott Drew, right? Yeah. So, yep. Um, I, I'm going to say Kansas State wins a nail biter in Lubbock, but I'll also go against the grain. And here's a spoiler alert. Oh no! I'll, I'll actually say Scott Drew gets his payback and beats the Cats in Manhattan on Tuesday. Yeah, that feels like probably a safe bet. Scott Drew's had to sit on it for a year that Jerome Tank beat him twice last year, and this is the only meeting on Tuesday, so that may not be the worst idea. Look, I well, I, 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 will, I will say, Kansas State, if they get a split in these next two games, because they're tough, right? They're going to mm-hmm. be the underdog in both games. Yeah. Or the, I, I think that – look, I, I – call me crazy or not, but I don't think they're going to lose at home to Oklahoma State. And if they did, that would be yeah. a black eye. So yeah, get a I'd, split. Get a split. And you're four and one in the Big Twelve. Yeah, yeah. If you if you don't beat Oklahoma State at home, just burn Bramlage down and throw everything away. But and but, it, but I will say this team's capable of just about anything. They did lose <laughs> by almost twenty to Nebraska. It's true. Yeah, at home. Uh, I I would not I would not rule anything out. Look. I talked up Cam Carter. I like the Tyler Perry pick. Uh, he's the key to a lot of things and unlocking it. I'm past the point of thinking that Tyler Perry is going to be the leading scorer and the best player on this team this year. I just don't know that it's possible given what we've seen. But it is important for him to be able to knock down those threes because K-State is missing really any good shooters right now. Kaluma, take more of them probably when you get your looks. Uh, Cam Carter, start to make a few more of them. But Perry knocking down the the looks that he has, that will be crucial. I talked up Cam Carter. I think the bigs are a really significant part of this game. Where you look at what Texas Tech is going to throw out onto the floor here, I mean, yes, Warren Washington is seven foot, but the next tallest guy out there is going to be 6'6". You're going to have a size advantage if you're K-State in this game. I think Will McNair, David Gasson have played well. You want to try to take advantage of that. And also, obviously, Arthur Kaluma being your three, that's a pretty big dude as well. Yeah. Well, are you going to give a little spoiler alert on, on what you, or we have to wait for the pick and preview? 
we're gonna have to wait for the pick and preview on that one. Ooh. Just uh, I, cool. look, I, I think it, I I did say I think it's gonna be close. I think we'll see a very back and forth game, and we'll see you're, how I'm feeling. You're, when you're I'm just still game. torn and conflicted, right? You don't even know what you're gonna do. Yeah, I mean, uh, here I'll tell people right now if I was picking it and writing it, I would probably pick Texas Tech to win the game. So that's. Do you think they're gonna split the next two? Uh, uh I, I I don't. I I think if you're gonna, I I, I couldn't tell you. I could see two and zero. Oh, I could see one and one. I could see zero oh and zero. Oh. We're gonna be five and zero oh in the Big Twelve. Maybe? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I really, I really could see anything happening. This team is at the stage now. They're playing well enough where I would not be surprised by anything that happens. So it's all on the table right now for K State. Well said. Okay. I okay. I'm. I'm. I think you're muted. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's all on the table for case that I am muted right there. Uh, here, let's let's shift out our gears here now. Take a look at what's coming up in the Big 12 to close things out this weekend. There's a look at it. KU and Oklahoma, top 10 matchup. Two teams coming off of losses in Allen Fieldhouse. Gets everything started. Then K-State at Tech, BYU at UCF, Houston at TCU, Texas at West Virginia, Oklahoma State at Iowa State, and Cincinnati at Baylor. Uh, what are the notable games that stand out to you there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, here, here's what I would do is Houston having to go back on the road. Now it's not a raucous atmosphere like it was at Hilton, but it, it is at TCU who has some dudes. So it'll be interesting to see the Houston response there. It'll be interesting. I Look, I'm not telling people to what to do with their money, but if they're going to wager on sports this weekend – there's probably not a line that I wouldn't take KU against Oklahoma in Allen Fieldhouse because you're going to get a pissed off Jayhawk team against the Sooners. Also coming off a loss, but it's in Allen. And I think Bill Self probably names the score in that game, if I had to guess. On the flip side, UCF is probably going to enjoy that win over KU longer than they should. So another good wager would be to fade the Knights because I, I think they play BYU, if I remember correctly. I know you put the scoreboard up there. Um, so off the top of my head, I, I don't remember. But I bet, I think it's BYU that's playing UCF this weekend. And I'm not sure there's a team in a Big 12 that I would back UCF against this weekend. So I would hammer BYU. I would hammer KU. I'll be interested to see what Baylor does because, yes, they're undefeated in the league. But in Big 12 play, they haven't been overly impressive yet. Yeah, they've struggled. I, although I would be shocked if Cincinnati could go on the road again and, and get a win against a top 25 team. Uh, I have reservations about KU and Oklahoma. Look, normally, a normal KU team, I would totally subscribe to your theory. But, I mean, we saw what the serious concerns with KU were in that UCF game. They don't really have any shooters. They struggle in a, a lot of ways. Like I'm, I'm not totally sold on KU right now and what they have going on. So I think they win. I just have a tough time predicting KU blowing Oklahoma out. Yeah, I can see that. Well, better case for BYU though. Better case for BYU. Very true. All right. Well, that'll do it for this edition of the KSO show. Thought we were going to get through, but it is uh, close to feeding time for uh, old Elliot Voth, and she is being a menace. I think she's worried about living in a world where K-State doesn't go 2-0 in the next couple games. She, she's dying for the Cats to win. Not a happy girl. Uh, <laughs> so we will bail out of here. Sorry for ruining everybody's day at the end of this thing again. But Cats, Texas Tech this weekend. We'll have full coverage of that throughout the week. And then getting set for the quick turnaround on Tuesday with Baylor. Massive home game. Students will be back. It'll be a fun time. That'll do it for us. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Both. Thanks for watching the KSO Show. Catch everything you need about K-State over at kstateonline.com.